I'm going to be speaking from down here because I have to see the screen, and we can't see the screen from the stage. So otherwise, I'd be talking in the in the dark. <laughs> now you can't see. <laughs> okay. Um, much of what I have to say has been published recently in a new Elsewhere book called uh, Evidence-Based Climate Science. And I'll be talking about carbon dioxide, talk a bit about uh, the oceans, a little bit about uh, solar interests on climate, and last, climate predictions. So if I can squeeze all that in in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I guess. So this, these are the topics. And I will tell you that carbon dioxide is not the cause of global warming. And I'll show you the evidence for that. I'll also talk a bit about the sun's influence, a bit about a uh, recurring pattern of climate changes that allows us to predict what's going to happen in the future. And at the end, I'll make a few comments perhaps on what needs to be done to, to restore uh, scientific integrity. So we're interested in evidence, and the evidence is very clear. So we want to test the concept that CO2 causes global warming. What we know is that CO2 emissions soared after 1945, post-World War II, at a, a very sharply increased rate. And any climate changes that occurred before 1945 can't be blamed on CO2 because it hadn't risen yet. And the test is that if global warming is caused by CO2, then temperature should correlate with CO2. So look what happened. Here we start to soar in 1945. Uh, this is the, these are our global emissions. And superimposed on that is what the climate was doing. So for the first 30 years after the big sharp increase, we had 30 years of global cooling. So from this you could conclude that CO2 causes global cooling. And then there has been some warming since then. So climate change is real, nobody denies that. And let's look then at what CO2 has in, in common um, with temperature. Here's where, this is about 1945, this is where the emissions began to rise sharply, and we have 30 years of global cooling. And before that, from 1915 to 1945, we had global warming without any increase in CO2. So who needs CO2? And it gets even, even um, more than that. In this graph, I've plotted temperatures from uh, isotopic evidence in ice cores. The red peaks are periods of global warming. And there are 20 on this graph, dating back to about 1500. If you go back even farther, if you go back 10,000 years, this is 10,000 years ago, this is the present, temperatures were about two and a half to five degrees warmer than present in Greenland. No CO2. And then about 1,500 years ago, we dropped into uh, what has become uh, the Little Ice Age. Going back even farther, 25, 30 years, 1,000 years, we have the last ice age with huge warming of 20 degrees in less than a century and dropping of temperature of 20 degrees in uh, perhaps around a century and rising of temperature about 20 degrees in a century all without the benefit of CO2. Second line of evidence is that CO2 cannot cause significant global warming by itself, simply because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is minuscule. The atmosphere now consists of about 41 thousandths of 1% of CO2. So if you take 100 molecules of air out of this room, you'll have only four molecules of carbon. It's about as close to nothing as you can get. If you double nothing, you've still got nothing. Not only that, but CO2 is a greenhouse gas, 
it accounts to only about 3.6% of the greenhouse effect. 95% uh, is water vapor. And the really telling <laughs> argument is that since 1945, 1950, which is the period supposed to be the one of global warming, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by only eight one thousandths of one percent. If you take the level in 1950 and the le absolute level, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere now is increased by eight one thousandths of one percent. And that isn't going to do very much. Third line of evidence is that CO2 always lags global warming, so it cannot be the cause of global warming. We know that from ice cores. Uh, these are from um, the Antarctic ice sheet. The blue line here is temperature, and the yellow line is carbon dioxide. And notice that carbon dioxide always follows the rise in temperature. It always lags temperature. So CO2 cannot be causing the warming. And that's true of each ice age in the past. I've just shown one here. It's even true on a shorter term. Uh, here is temperature, the blue curve, and the green is carbon dioxide. So if you take the peak of temperature and the peak of temperature, and Willie Soon has shown that there's no correlation at all between CO2 and temperature. This line right here is carbon dioxide. Here is warm temperature, here's cool temperature, um, and there's no, no correlation. So we can conclude from that that there have been many, many, many periods of global warming which could not have been caused by CO2. And if you add all these up, you can only get about one-tenth of one percent of global warming periods that correlate with CO2. Not very convincing. 99.9 percent .9 of geologic warming in the past uh, has been, uh, cannot have been caused by CO2. Or, um, so there's so little CO2 in the atmosphere that the conclusion is inescapable that carbon dioxide has no significant effect on global temperature. And it's also been shown that cutting carbon dioxide emissions will not change atmospheric CO2. You could spend a trillion dollars in 10 years and the figures are that it would change temperature less than one-tenth of one degree. So if CO2 is not the cause, what is? And we can look at historic uh, temperatures and we get warm periods and, and um, cool periods. Uh, this is a structure in Greenland um, about 1400 years ago, or 1400 AD, uh, when the climate there was warmer. And there's a direct correlation with sunspots. Sunspots are these dots around the sun discovered by Galileo in 1609, a closer view. Dark is cooler, and they're dipolar. They make big arcs, magnetic arcs, uh, between those points. So the first clue comes from the relationship between sunspots and climate that occurred during what's called a Maunder Minimum. For 50 years, from 1650 to about 1700, there were virtually no sunspots. And this is what happened to the climate. Uh, this is the temperature curve, uh, the red line from central England, and it shows that there was strong cooling. Glaciers advanced in the Alps. Uh, the Thames froze over. They had pairs there. And there's an interesting correlation between the number of sunspots. Uh, this is the number of sunspots. Each of these is a cold period. And so every time we have low sunspots, we get a cool period. The same is true with what's called TSI, total solar irradiance. Think of that as the energy coming from the sun in watts per uh, square meter. TSI shows the same thing. It follows the temperature. And on this graph, you see a temperature curve. And these are the, this is, the red line is the TSI. Again, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So how can this affect, possibly affect climate? Well, it may be that the uh, magnetic field of the sun has an effect on incoming radiation. Uh, many of you are familiar with what's called a Wilson cloud chamber, where if you um, uh, have a, a situation where you have water vapor uh, and you allow um, 
just uh, radiation in the atmosphere to go through it, they, they leave contrails like a jetliner. And these are a function then of how many cosmic, how much cosmic radiation is coming to that, that particular place. When the sun has a low magnetic field strength, think of the sun's magnetic field as a giant shield that's shielding the earth from cosmic rays. When we have a low field strength, we have um, fewer sunspots, we have smaller uh, solar irradiance, and therefore we have, we have more galactic cosmic rays coming into the atmosphere, which is producing more clouds via the uh, Wilson cloud effect. That causes more sunlight to be reflected into space and the Earth becomes cooler. And the same is in the opposite direction. High solar field strength, more sunspots, more TSI, fewer cosmic rays, less cloud formation, less sunlight reflected, and in a warmer climate. And this is the data. I'm going to skip through this really quickly. I just want to show you this exists. You can find this in the reprints uh, of, the, um, of the Elsevier book. And if you, any of you want that, uh, you can just email me. Email me. I left some uh, outside on the, on the counters. But in, in, a, in a word, um, there's a direct correlation between sunspots and cosmic rays. So to, how can we check this? Well, we can look at the production of beryllium-10 and carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere because it is produced by cosmic radiation. More cosmic radiation, more beryllium-10, and more carbon-14. And here it is. Beryllium-10 is high. Uh, it corresponds well with sunspots. And if you plot the um, amount of beryllium-10, which is being produced by cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere, compare that to, uh, to temperature, look at the correlation. There's a direct correlation. And uh, the same thing is true between beryllium-10 and radiocarbon. They show an amazingly similar record, so they reinforce one another, and um, therefore we think it's probably correct. So the conclusion is that low solar magnetic fields increase cosmic radiation. That induces atmospheric condensation that leads to increased cloudiness and cooler temperature. This is the hypothesis first um, uh, put forth by Heinrich Spensmark of, of Denmark, uh, and this is now the isotopic evidence that seems to confirm that idea. So how about the next 30 years? Well, in 1977, we're worrying about an ice age. 2008, need to be worried. Um, and so what can we expect? What we can do is to uh, look at some predicting methods. Uh, models don't work. Here's the model um, prediction. Here's where we actually are, big difference. But we can look into the past. The past is the key to the future. And we can, we can establish well-defined cyclical patterns of warming and cooling that allows us to project that pattern into the future. Um, I'll skip that one. And so here is a graph that shows glacier advance, glacier recession. In the North Pacific, we had cool water, warm water, cool water. And here's the global temperature, cooling, warming, cooling. So there's a direct correlation here between what's going on in the ocean waters and what's going on in the atmosphere. These changes are called the PDO, the Pacific Dectal Oscillation. It has a, um, a, a time of about a 60 year for a full cycle. So here is um, a cool climate uh, as uh, indicated by the, um, the cool ocean water. And here's a, here is a warm climate. The ocean has two modes. It's like an on-off switch. It's either warming or cooling. There's nothing in between. It flips from one mode uh, to another. Uh, I'm going to skip that. And so if we look at the past PDO, it was cool from 1945 to 1977 in the oceans. And sure enough, the atmospheric temperature follows that. Uh, before that, from 1950 to 1945, we had warm ocean water. So what we can do is to take the past history of warming, cooling, warming, cooling on a 60-year cycle 
and project it into the future, which is what I've done here. So uh, at, um, at, at this particular point, I predicted in 1998 that we'd be in for global cooling. And sure enough, um, we, we have. This is what I said in 2000, um, global warming is over, we can look ahead to cooler climates. And the question is how much? We don't really know exactly, uh, time will tell, but there are various models to uh, suggest uh, some differences. How well has my prediction uh, been doing? This is just for the US, but there's a slight cooling train, not a lot. Um, winter temperatures uh, from 2000 to 2010 were about eight degrees cooler in the central US and a couple degrees uh, cooler on the, on the coast. So uh, I'm going to skip through this um, and suggest that you don't throw away your park as yet. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Can I have a hand?